belt line to Broadway. Belt line, oh my, helps get through the tough times. Broadway, hooray. Let's all tune in to belt line to Broadway. What do you say? You could binge any day. Listening to belt line to Broadway. Belt line to Broadway. This is the Beltline to Broadway podcast. I'm Lauren Van Hamert, your host, and on this episode, I'm chatting with Megan McGinnis and Adam Halpin, the real-life husband and wife super couple who were starring in the Theatre Raleigh production of City of Angels. This isn't the first time the couple has worked together on stage. They were both on the national tour of Come From Away and worked opposite each other on the off-Broadway production of Daddy Long Legs in 2015. But their love story begins long before that, during a chance meeting when Megan was starring as Belle in Disney's Beauty and the Beast. And that is where our conversation begins. We first met, I first laid eyes on Megan when I was a senior in college at Rutgers and my uh, best buddy and I came into the city to see a concert performance, a benefit concert of this musical called Illyria, which is a musicalization of Twelfth Night. Mm -hmm. And we had a friend in it and Megan was playing viola and we sat there and she opened her mouth and I was like, what, who is this person? (laughs) And... I was proceeded to be blown away by her. And afterwards at the after party, uh, I made a, I made a beeline to try to talk to her just to tell her I thought she was great. And just to find out a little bit about who she was. And uh, at the time she was playing bell in beauty and the beast on Broadway. And we spoke for about, I don't know, eight to 10 minutes, the three of us. Just, and she told me that she went to Columbia and I sort of got a little bit of a background and and then uh, went our separate ways, and you know I went back to school and moved to Pittsburgh for a year and a half. And and by the time I got back to New- I moved to New York, it was like she was still on my mind. Like every every now and again, I'd think about her. I'd be like, oh, I wanna, wonder when I'm going to run into her again. And uh, a couple of years later, we did. You know, pick up that story. Yeah. So I don't remember meeting Adam at <laughs> the party afterwards, uh, but I believe him. I believe him that we met. Uh, I went to see him in his first Broadway show, Glory Days. I was at the dress rehearsal and I met him in the lobby afterwards. And he reminded me that we'd met before. And I was like, oh, yeah, maybe, maybe I remember that. So I was really taken with him, his talent and his uh, blue eyes. And uh, we re-met again a couple months later at an audition. We were both in the waiting room at Pearl Studios in Midtown. And it was one of those auditions where it was just hours long and they were matching people up. And I walked in and there he was with his blue eyes. And I was like, oh, yeah, Yeah, he's really nice. And we just talked for all the hours that we were there. Yeah. And then he Facebook messaged me the next day and said something like, have you heard anything? And my first thought was, oh, an actor. What an actor question that is. But then he proceeded to surprise me. And uh, we started talking about politics. And um, we ended up volunteering for the Obama campaign in 2008 together. And that was sort of our first date, (laughs) was volunteering and knocking on doors in Pennsylvania. Uh, And he asked me out officially on our first date uh, the night Obama was elected. Aside from being so crazy talented, you both really are such wonderful advocates and I would say social justice warriors, especially during COVID and post-COVID. So what role do you all think as artists, as parents, um, that the performing arts play in all these social justice conversations we're having right now? It's, yeah, it's interesting. I, uh, Lauren actually said something interesting, our, our director the other night, she said, uh, you know, we're not, as we were doing like one of our first runs, we're not, you know, we're not, we're not doctors. We're not, we're not saving lives here, but we are inspiring lives. And I think that I, I approach every show that I'm doing with like, okay, listen, I'm an actor. I'm telling a story. Like there's, there's so much power in that. Um, and I just try to bring my my moral 
center to that, to whatever I'm doing and hope that the shows and many shows do this, which is tell a story of, you know, of compassion and love and understanding. I think I try to bring that uh, to everything I do. That's really, it's really important to me. I think what makes a great actor is great empathy. Mm -hmm. And so it's, I think, very natural for us to want to advocate um, for everybody, but it is a particularly um, difficult time right now. And I think we've also done a lot of learning uh, about the world in these last couple of years. And so, um, yeah, I think I'm always just trying to keep my eyes open and to learn from all those around me, because one of the great things about uh, this business is it takes us to lots of different places and to meet a lot of different people. Yeah, you almost can't help but be empathetic. If your eyes are open, you can't help it because you see people from all walks of life, of every background, and you're, you know, you're telling stories to people who, you know, I can think of being on tour and touring the country. I've been on three tours and I can think about doing like kinky boots, for instance. And I felt like inevitably there was always like that stereotypical uh, burly white man in the front row of every performance and you would watch him with his arms crossed as the show started, like, oh, my wife dragged me to this show. And by by curtain call, without a doubt, he was the first one up on his feet. Like, and I just think, yes, we all, we we know what, how theater can be powerful and how it can how, how it can inspire people and get them to see um, other people's perspectives. And I, I just it's 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 so valuable to me to to do that. I want to talk about Daddy Long Legs. It's such a a beautiful show. And I feel like it's this small show that just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger because of the streaming. You all were the first to stream before it was trendy to stream <laughs> in 2015. And now it's available on Broadway HD. And I feel like it has developed almost this cult following. You you lived with this show for so long. You did this show for so long. Are you surprised by its longevity and its, <laughs> for lack of a better word, legs? I'm not surprised at all. I mean, that's how I felt about it when I first read the script, which I remember so vividly. Adam was on tour. Which tour was it? It was Rent. Rent. And I was visiting him in Arizona and I read the script in between shows um, one day. And I remember just being like, Adam, you go to dinner. I, I got to finish this. I mean, it just enveloped me. And the first thing I thought was, oh, this has legs. I mean, that was, I knew this was a special show and for lack of a better term, producible. You know, it's a small show and theater is getting harder and harder these days to produce. And considering that it was small, small orchestra, two people and such a gem, I I knew it was going to go far. And Daddy Long Legs had a reunion during the pandemic, which I kind of love. But, you know, while everyone was struggling with streaming, I feel like you guys are like, yeah, been there, done that. Well, and that was that was all Ken Davenport you know, one of our producers, he's, that was his idea. And, uh, he knew what he was doing. Uh, when, when he first came to me about it, I was really not for it. I thought, well, why would you give this away for free? Who's going to come pay, buy a ticket now? And then I remembered how often I watched into the woods on VHS and all I wanted to do was see it live anywhere. Didn't have to be Broadway, you know, it, regional community theater. I didn't care. That VHS made me want to see it live. And no matter how many times I watched that tape. So I thought, oh, no, maybe he's right. And then as the run continued after the live stream, people would come up and say, I saw the live stream and that's why I'm here. Also, the people who never will be able to make it to New York, who can't afford that, that we were able to bring it to them. That was a really great feeling as well. Which is such a gigantic amount of the population who will never or, you know, once in a lifetime will come to New York. So, like, why not? I was I will, I will make it that I was very pro. This from the <laughs> <He> start. <was. laughs> I, I thought this was an excellent idea. Yeah. I was like, nope, it's it increases the brand. It gives it lets this show, which, you know, had sort of gradually like it did 
11 stops, you know, we, regional theaters everywhere. Megan did it in London. I'm like, this show, that's how it gets there is word of mouth. And uh, this was really awesome. Megan, in, in 2015, a reporter asked you about gender parity in theater. And at the time, you said you wanted to see more female artistic directors running regional theaters. I feel like we're really lucky here in this area because we have some really strong um, female leadership in our, our theaters, including Theater Raleigh. So talk about your experiences working here at Theater Raleigh with Lauren Kennedy Brady, who is um, Theater Raleigh's producing artistic director. I have always been a huge fan of Lauren's since I moved to New York and I remember her first singing at a Jason Robert Brown concert, mm-hmm. singing one of the songs from last five years. And I just thought, who is this woman? How do I meet her? <laughs> How can I be more like her? And I, I met her a couple of times socially when she still lived in the city and we had a lot of friends in common. And then before I knew it, she'd started this whole new career in Raleigh, running a theater. And not until uh, I heard that she was producing Daddy Long Legs here, did I reach out. I I think I'd always been a bit nervous. You know, I admired her so much. Um, But when I heard about Daddy Long Legs, I just thought, you know what, I've got nothing to lose. I know she's a kind person. She'll she'll let me down easy if she doesn't want me to direct. And I said, hey, I I heard you doing this show. I know this show better than anybody. Let me try it out. And I was... Which is not hyperbole. She knows it better than anyone, <laughs> including the writers. And the, the writers director. would agree. <laughs> um, and she said, yes. And we came down and I was so supported by her. It was extraordinary to feel all my nerves just went away because she believed in me and encouraged me and helped me when I didn't know what I was doing. You know, first time I'd ever run a tech rehearsal. Okay. Talk me through this. Like, what is it, what is it like on the other side of the table? And I I just thought if I can come back here anytime in any capacity, I'm fully in. And now I get to experience her as a director and wow, I, um, I'm floored. She's amazing. I don't really have enough adjectives to describe how wonderful it is to be in a room with her. Not only does she help me understand any moment that I'm at a loss for, but she's inspiring. I mean, you just want to do your best for her, but at the same time, she makes you feel like you're always doing your best. Mm. I, I don't know how she does it. So uh, as much as she can, um, as much as she will welcome us back, I will be back. (laughs) Yeah, we're already scheming to get ourselves back here for sure. You mentioned City of Angels. Lauren is directing it. I love this show so much. I love this score. What, What have been the challenges of diving into this particular piece? The reason we're here, other than Lauren, is that it's one of Adam's favorite shows. So when he found out that Theater Raleigh was doing it, he was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Not only is somebody doing City of Angels, Lauren is doing City of Angels. <laughs> He's always been, well, I don't want to speak for you. You, you go ahead. What were you going to say? Well, I, I've, <laughs> I've always loved this the show, but I've never seen it. Um, because, a, it's never done. And yeah, I, I just, I, I didn't know what it looked like. So uh, I, you know, listened to the cast recording a hundred or so times and loved the score and reading the scripts. I was blown away by how good the script was. And I was Mm -hmm. like, what? Okay. So I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop on this one. Like what's wrong with this show? And you really realize it's it's ultimately just difficult (laughs) and it can be really confusing. And I think that that was what people had said in the past. It's like hard to follow. And I don't really find it hard to follow. No, it's just, it's just, you're following multiple timelines. So it's just the director's responsibility and the actress's responsibility to be clear on what everyone's seeing. And I'm really excited for everyone to see it here. Uh, Yeah. I think that the script is hard to follow on the page, right? It's just hard to follow on the page, but once you put it on its feet, it's so fun because you have the two storylines. You have the writer Stein who Adam plays writing. He wrote a book and now his book is being adapted 
for as a screenplay. And he's doing that adaptation. So you see him as he writes the screenplay and you see the screenplay as if the movie were actually happening. And all of us get to play a role in both the real world and the fictional world, except for Adam. Oh, and the other and Adam. For Stone. And Adam Monley. And for Stone, who is sort of like the other half of me, like my protagonist in my story. Yeah. So it's just um, so fun, that back and forth. And it's old time Hollywood. It's, it's a blast to do. And I think it'll be so fun to watch. Be- Beckett is here with you. How is it? traveling and performing and being working parents in this industry with a five and a half year old. Being a parent in this business is really hard. Um, It's not set up for parents. Um, That being said, I think in this time of change that it's getting a little better. Um, It's just hard. The schedule is hard. You know, one of the great things about our schedule here is we actually have our days free during rehearsals. And so we miss bedtime, which is a thing, of course, but we get to spend all day with him and then go to rehearsal at night. Uh, Typically, that's not the case. Uh, Once we're on a show schedule, it'll be the same. We get the days with him. We have an amazing babysitter here. I mean, I think that's the hardest part of traveling with a child is finding babysitters, (laughs) people you can trust and people that will uphold the things that you want your child to be taught or how they're cared for. And Beckett is, he's so friendly and charming and loves new people. So we are super lucky in that sense. He's like, cool. Home is wherever we all are. I get it. Uh, That being said, you know, he, today he did say, I miss home. I want to go home. And I said, yeah, I miss home too. But mommy and daddy are really happy here. We're really happy doing what we love. Mm -hmm. And I want him to understand that. I think that's important for him to understand. Megan, your mom introduced you to the Mikado at three. (laughs) Adam, (laughs) you grew up on all these vinyl records, original Broadway cast recordings. So what's the soundtrack of Beckett's childhood? Classical. Yeah, he only listens to, (laughs) we we basically, if you listen to classical music since birth and he enjoys it so much. We're just running with it. And like, we're not going to introduce him to, you know, kids bop and all that stuff for as long as I can stand it. So like he's five and a half and he really only knows classical music and some jazz. It's funny. We didn't do it on purpose. Not really. No. We um, started watching little Einstein's when he was little. I don't know if you know that show, but they take one classical piece and one art piece and sort of have an adventure around those two things. And so he learned the Little Einstein's playlist. So he knew that playlist by heart, those 15 songs he could name. If he would have, he loved the game of us picking a song and him saying, oh, that's Dvorak Symphony Number 9, which is one of his favorite pieces. Um, So now we have all of a sudden a three-year-old who's obsessed with Dvorak. (laughs) We thought, oh, well, we'll run with this. Yeah. And now at five and a half, it's just kept, growing yeah it's the same you know it's ebbed and flowed in some ways as far as how much he wants to listen to music but when it's on and he's engaged and not reading or something he's oh he's like what is this add it to my favorite songs playlist yeah. which he has on our phones like he has a notes section where anything he hears that he likes he wants me to write it down <laughs> so. and then he also randomly his other favorite song right now is celebrate good times <laughs> Come on. Yeah, so when, you know? when, when anything good happens he sings that because yeah. i think his one of his sitters uh back home Played it. Play that song for him. Like, I love this. (laughs) It's like it's his anthem of like good times, which is great. (laughs) I love that so much. Um, Between the two of you, you've done theater, TV, film. Do you have a favorite medium? Uh, I, I, it's hard for me to pick a favorite. I think I I like doing all of them in tandem. Mm -hmm. And I think that keeps it fresh and it keeps my, my skills up. Uh, in some way, I, I feel like, oh, ooh, I've been, the uh, last five years or so, I've been singing a lot in the studio, doing a lot of studio singing on uh, soundtracks and cast albums and stuff. Um, and that's been a great source of uh, fun and uh, a different skill set, just singing in the studio. And uh, I, I love that. I love being on set. I've also been writing. You know, I, I find it all equally thrilling. Mm. I think in the last, you know, during the pandemic, these last couple of years, there definitely is just not a favorite. It's just about work. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's been, it's just been so much harder. 
Um, and obviously it took theater a lot longer to come back. It all makes me happy and uh, it, it feels uh, even more special these days. I will say for Megan, she, she directed Eddie Long Legs and she did such a fantastic job. And uh, I can feel her itching to direct again. She's been teaching oh, as well. Oh, can you? So I think, <laughs> I think that that's going to be a nice uh, uh, thing for her to, to do uh, on the reg, as the kids say. Oh, the kids say that? Well, at least kids younger than me. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I find that to be, uh, that's going to be a part of her, her skill set. I think she's really good at it. She's really good at talking, um, to actors and, uh, she's really smart. So I think that's going to be happening a lot more for her as well. I have been teaching a lot, uh, during the pandemic, uh, too. So that's been, that's been another way to feel creative for sure. What do you hope folks will take away from seeing this beautiful production of city of angels, which I can't wait to see. <laughs> Uh, fun. I feel like that's the biggest word for me. I have so much fun watching this cast and this show, hearing this score. It's so fun. It's really fun. It's also, you don't really know where it's going in some ways. Uh, like there's some really unpredictable moments and there's kind of some meta stuff happening. It's like show within a show, within a show, within a musical, <laughs> um, which is cool. Yeah, I just think it's really different and unique and special, and I, I can't wait to see what people think. The Theater Raleigh production of City of Angels runs through August 14th. I'll put a link in the episode notes. If you like what you've heard today, please consider subscribing to this podcast. Follow us on social media at Beltline to Broadway on Facebook or Instagram or Beltline to B-Way on Twitter or visit us online at Beltline to Broadway.org. Until next time, I'll see you at the theater. Belt line to Broadway.